Welcome to this week's webinar. I'm Mike O'Neill and joining me this morning are two folks. You probably have gotten to know Rhonda over the last number of weeks. Rhonda Beard, say hi. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining again. And we are welcome to our webinar this morning, Christina Hooper. Hi. I will introduce Christina here in a little bit uh, to give you a little more detail, but you'll notice um, that in today's time, we're doing things that we didn't think we'd ever be doing before. A month ago, to think that bench builders would be hosting a webinar would be kind of unthinkable for us. That's something that took us way out of our comfort zone. And here we are hosting our fifth webinar uh, in the last five weeks. If you also ask that we'd be willing to kind of go on camera, we would have said, no, we won't do that. And here we are. We hope this is not a distraction to you, but we really are trying to emphasize what makes this work is we want to hear from you. We want this to be different than what you perhaps are experiencing with other webinars. We don't want to be a bunch of talking heads talking to you. This is designed to be a Q&A. We wish we had the luxury of opening the mics to everybody, but given the sheer number of folks who are on this webinar, we just can't do that. But we're glad you're with us. Um, to give you a little bit of sense of what we intend to do today. This is what y'all asked for, and this is what we're going to try to cover. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to be turning to Christina in a moment. And Christina is going to share with us some just practical ways that we can be ever mindful that in the COVID crisis, the power of the internet is undeniable. And if a customer has a bad experience or if an employee ha has a bad experience, the whole world knows. And you all have worked very hard. The majority of the folks on this webinar come from either a small business owner perspective or you're in HR capacity. And you all have worked real hard to establish an online reputation. We're gonna spend time with Christina this morning learning more about what can and what should we be doing to make sure that our reputation does not suffer through COVID. Rhonda is also going to uh, update us on the latest from a compliance standpoint when we're talking about HIPAA and ADA during COVID. Uh, questions that we never thought we'd have to answer, we have to be knowledgeable on, and Rhonda will give us an update on that. Um, as we speak, um, the House is scheduled to approve a another version of the Corona relief bill, and we'll cover that briefly. And time permitting, we also like to share with those who are on this webinar, some additional resources that we hope you would find valuable. So we're gonna start with Christina. Christina, we're glad to have you with us this morning. Welcome. Hey, I'm glad to be here. For those who don't know Christina, she is an incredible a person on multiple levels. We've got to know Christina because she advises us on a number of things, but what I have found with her is personally, she stays in the know. She stays very current in what's going on. She shares that knowledge, and we thought what she knows about establishing and maintaining an online reputation, we couldn't think of anybody better than Christina. So Christina, it's yours. All right, I appreciate the introduction, Mike. Um, I know right now a lot of businesses are probably just busy thinking about how to keep the doors open and imagining a world, you know, four weeks out, eight weeks out, six months out is hard to visualize. But like I was on a webinar with Mark Cuban from Shark Tank, who is advising the president on how we're going to open the country back up just yesterday. And the advice that he was giving is that this is not going to end in 2020. You are going to be dealing with this all the way into 2021. It's not going anywhere. And he said, think about businesses that, you know, local clothing stores that let you try on clothes and have fitting rooms. You know, think about restaurants where, you know, you're supposed to stay six feet apart. Well, how do you do that? You know, if you have people that come in with you, is it the restaurant owner's job to make sure that you can't sit close together with your husband or your kids? or you know, your in-laws who you're meeting at the restaurant, like how do they do that? If you only have 15 tables and they're kind of close together, how are you supposed to you know, seat enough tables and bring enough people in to even pay for operations to keep your business open? 
Mm. These are questions that, you know, companies still don't have answers to. And even as Georgia's getting ready to open back up and they're putting all these guidelines in place. I know Beth's in an email out through the chamber that, you know, told you some of the strict requirements. Everybody's thinking we're just going to open, but it's not just open. There's very specific requirements that you have to meet. You know, hotels, I saw something in the news that the Marriott is going to be using hospital grade disinfectant on all of the rooms. Mm. You know, we're dealing with things like having to, you know, maybe do construction and remodeling on bathrooms, having to, you know, change filtration systems and AC. So small businesses are going to have all these costs that they're about to incur and all these potential issues that they're about to encounter. Like, you know, if you don't follow some guideline that isn't even published yet and somebody were to get sick in your store, an employee, a customer, anything, how you handle things right now is gonna be incredibly important as you start to open your business back up and you're gonna have all these additional costs, all these additional things that you have to deal with and demand's gonna be less. People are doing more research into different options. You know, restaurants are gonna to have to continue to offer takeout because it's gonna be in demand. You know, Amazon is out of stock on things. People are buying from stores they've never bought from because they can't buy from Amazon. I mean, even me, that was like my go-to for most of my stuff. I have a monthly subscription save delivery. Now I'm looking for vendors that carry stuff that have it in stock and I'm buying from companies I've never heard of. I'm doing research online before I buy. So that's where your online reputation really starts to come into play. People are going to want to see, you know, that you're doing these things to keep them safe. They're going to want to see what you're offering. Employees are going to want to know that if they come to work for you, that you're doing things to protect them while they're there. You've got sites like Glassdoor where employees can leave reviews. And if you go kind of browse around on there right now, you're seeing lots of negative reviews from companies, big ones and little, about how they handled this. You know, they're being required to come into work. And I mean, these are things that I'm knowing about because I'm on social media, because I'm on these review sites, because I'm looking at businesses. So I found this information. That means future employees, future customers can see this. So can we, in terms of uh, focus initially on, we've got a number of business owners on this webinar um, who may have a online presence, but if they do, they're, they're trying to nurture that along. Let's start with them. For business owners, what are the kinds of things they should be doing right now to make sure that their online reputation doesn't suffer? I mean, number one, you need to make sure that you have control over any of the review sites. So stuff like Glassdoor, you can't take a review down. You can't ask them to take a review down. Once a review is published, it's there. You can, however, respond to the review as a company. So make sure you're monitoring Glassdoor from an employer perspective. Also look at Google, look at Facebook. And if you don't have a Facebook page, if you have not claimed your Google local listing, you definitely need to go do that that's going to let you respond to reviews. So again, you can't really take negative reviews down. You're stuck with them, negative or positive, they're there. The biggest thing you can do is to try and get more positive reviews. So reach out to customers and ask for reviews. This is absolutely a time to do that. That way, you know, those little star ratings matter. Some people won't dig deeper, they'll just look at the stars. So if you have 30 positive reviews and two negative reviews, your stars are going to average out to be higher. So ask for as many positive reviews as you can get from past customers, from acquaintances. Um, even family and friends can leave reviews. They can, especially for small business owners, they can leave reviews about your character, about your personality, about your commitment to your customers and to your employees. Ask for that language specifically when you're talking to friends and family and get as many reviews as you can on Google and on Facebook and make sure that you're responding. If you said claim the Google listing, tell me a little more about what that means. How do you claim a Google listing if you have not? Yeah, if you search Google My Business, you'll see it come up, like that phrase, Google My Business. It's gonna come up and Google will walk you through exactly what to do. Um, they will mail you a postcard to an address. So you'll wanna, it takes a couple weeks. So the sooner you get started on that, the better. And that's just them verifying that you do exist. So you will have to go check your mail and you'll have to get the postcard. It'll have a pen number on it. You want to put it in. Um, I mean, anybody can reach out to me and I can walk you through it as well. Um, but it's pretty straightforward to do. It's pretty easy to do. Um, now in the same way, Facebook, um, do you claim a Facebook or is this basically you set up your own Facebook company page? 
it depends if you've had employees or customers that have left reviews and stuff for you online there are cases where facebook will create an auto generated page for you because it knows your business exists even if you haven't told them um, so just search Facebook and see if you find yourself. If you do, there's going to be a link in the top right hand corner right underneath the picture that says, is this your business? You can click that and claim that page. Um, you can also do that search and maybe you've created your own page, but Facebook has also created your page. You can merge that auto create a page into your page by saying, you know, is this my business and clicking it and it will ask you, do you already have a page or do you want this page? I failed to properly introduce you a moment ago, and that is Christina is the COO of Sparkative, and this is the kind of thing that they help clients with, but can you give the folks who are on this webinar a little better feel for who is Sparkative? I have, we're an online marketing web development company. We've been in business since um, 2011 as Sparkative, and then I had my own company for a little bit longer before that. Um, been building websites since before businesses needed websites and since before Google really was hard to rank on. Um, and mostly working with small businesses, service-based businesses have been kind of our niche. Um, but advising people on marketing strategies, how to you know, do things like maintaining your reputation, generate leads, get your website up, get found. Excellent. Thank you so much. So that means you're a small business owner as well. Um, and you're an employer. So from an employer standpoint, you mentioned Glassdoor, but if you have a reputation as an employer, you're trying to maintain, what is it employers should be doing? We've got a number of folks out of the HR area and they oftentimes are kind of tasked with this responsibility. What should employers be doing right now? And the biggest thing is to make sure that you're keeping your employees educated, that you're making sure they know what's going on. A lot of the stuff that I'm seeing when employers are talking negatively about their companies, tends to revolve around misunderstandings about company policies, a lack of information. It comes from a place of fear. It comes from a place of resentment. If you're putting your employees first, you're communicating to them and you're letting them know like, hey, yes, I, you know, I may be a business owner, but I'm also a human. I'm doing the best I can in this situation. I care about you guys. I want to let you know I'm okay. I want to let you know the business is, you know, how we're doing and how that's going to impact you. Um, I know you guys are way more qualified than I am to talk about, you know, implementing policies around social media and stuff along those lines for existing employees, making sure they're aware of your company's social media policies, what they're allowed to post, what they're not allowed to post, things along those lines. But I think right now, especially cracking the whip doesn't solve the problem, because if you've got employees that are laid off, if you're having to furlough employees, if you've got people that are technically not an employee for you right now, they can say whatever they want to say. And there's very little recourse that you have in those situations. And I think even trying to take recourse, if you have access to it, if you come back to that social media policy and you're like, you violated our policy, you're in trouble. They're going to be like, I quit. I can make money on unemployment. Screw you. And they're going to leave. <laughs> So I think cracking the whip isn't necessarily the best answer. I think communicating with your employees and letting them know that you're there, being transparent about what you're doing, being transparent about their place, their role, making sure that they feel valued. That is the biggest thing you can do. I mean, I've seen people in videos online on social media that are just literally in tears, crying because their employer hasn't told them anything. They don't know if their job's in jeopardy. They have unrealistic expectations, like they have to wear a mask to work, but the employer's not providing it. They're scared they're going to get fired because they can't bring a homemade mask. They have to buy one, and they can't buy one, and if they can find one, it's three weeks worth of shipping. It has to be certain colors, like it has to be black or white. It can't be, you know, fun patterns or anything. Like now isn't the time for business owners to put those kind of restrictions on employees. If they want to make a mask at home and wear it, applaud their initiative. <laughs> so you know? you've stressed the importance as an employer to keep the employees um, informed. Rhonda, I want to throw this to you for a question. Rhonda, in, in your opinion, from an HR perspective, in today's climate, what's the best way to keep our employees informed? Well, and I think that's one of the questions out there, too, and how, you know, how do employers stay up to date on what's going on? Because it's changing so rapidly. And as an employer or HR manager professional, there are some websites that you can sign up to get alerts on, for instance, changes with the CARES Act or changes with some of the reopening in your communities, uh, different news feeds. So we can send out some of those links to help employers keep up to date 
on changes. But as Christine is saying, the more you can communicate to your employees, the better. In a lot of the training that we do, management training, one of the things I always teach is you can never over communicate. You can never tell people too much information. And right now people are really thriving to know what's going on. And we've mentioned in previous webinars as well, that if you, if they're going to be out posting on social media, at least give them something positive to post about. Mm. So make sure that they're posting factual information. So the more you can feed them, the more likely they are to post things that you're telling them that can be positive and factual. So give them as much information through as many methods as you can, whether it's email, um, you know, in-person, small group meetings, text messages. We talked about group texting apps before and even mailing letters home. And that gets the whole family involved as well and knowing what the employer's doing to try to take care of employees as well as their families. So the more, the better. Well, if you right. know that your employees feel positively about your company, leverage that too. Ask for yeah. reviews on Glassdoor. Ask employees to leave reviews on Facebook. Ask them to leave reviews on Google and to talk about your company. Use your marketing software if you have it. Your MailChimp, social media, like Hootsuite to post out updates to your employees as well. Um, and attend this webinar that Mike and them are doing every single week. Like if you're worried about how to keep up to date as an employer, like I'm on a, at least one to two webinars every single day. They are out there webinars like this that you normally would not be able to get access to these kind of experts without shelling out top dollar. Go to these webinars. Like I said, I was on one with Mark Cuban just yesterday. What are the odds that, you know, local business owner like me from Flintstone, Georgia is going to be on a Q&A webinar with Mark Cuban? Like these resources are out there, use them. Uh, that's very helpful. You know, Susan asked the question right off the bat. With all this information available, I'm, I am more concerned about what I may not know. And she asked, what are your recommendations for the best way to keep your employees and the company up to date on the information? Christina, you talk even faster than I do. And if you all are trying to write this down, let me share with you what we are going to do. She rattled off a number of ways in which you can do that, resources. And so as a person who is registered for this webinar, you'll be getting a kind of a recap of the questions that have, been come, that have come up, but you're also gonna be getting uh, links to the resources that Christina just mentioned. So know that um, if you're trying to write frantically, we've got that and we'll include that in the follow-up packet. So be aware of that. Uh, Christian, another question came up, and that is, how often should I look at the social media to see what the customers are saying? I mean, I would look every day. I mean, think about if somebody were to email you or were to message you a question or were to say something. Sometimes people will ask questions on social media, and they're expecting, a, you know, even faster than normal response. If you send an email, 24 to 48 hours is a pretty typical wait time to get a response from a company. Social media, you expect an answer in less than 24 hours. Mm. So it's even faster. Um, to help that though, there are tools that you can do. So like there's social listening tools with like Hootsuite, with HubSpot, with different softwares that are out there. And a lot of these software vendors are offering discounts and things to get you started. So you could use their software temporarily at a lower cost. There's also a lot of free software. Um, you can install like with Facebook, for example, you can put the Facebook pages app on your phone and you can get notifications directly on your phone so you don't miss them. So when I say, you know, every day, that doesn't mean devote three and four hours of your life to sitting in front of your social media and sending yourself down a social rabbit hole. Set up these notifications so you get alerts and you can respond if somebody mentions your company name or comments on a post or sends you a message directly. Well, I think the people on the webinar can see what I've seen for some time. You're a valuable resource. Would you be willing to stay on with us um, as we move into some other topics? We may want to come back to some of the things that you've raised. Can you stay with us for a little bit? Yeah, definitely. All right, thank you. Uh, one of the questions that has come up prior to the webinar is, goodness gracious, how in the world are we supposed to keep up with all these requirements from a HIPAA standpoint and from an ADA standpoint? Rhonda's going to kind of give us an update on what we should be doing. Okay, thanks, Mike. And last week, we talked a little bit about some HIPAA and ADA compliance with your employees and what you can and cannot do and say and what, what kind of information you can ask for and share. And I wanted to talk about that as it relates to interviews, candidates coming in for interviews, applying for jobs, making job offers, 
because it's pretty similar, but there are some things that you need to make sure that you're careful about. And that is uh, making sure you're not asking things of candidates that can flop over into ADA protection and start revealing information about their potential disabilities. So, you know, initially what kind of came out was, well, you can ask questions about their symptoms, you can take their temperature and ask them things specifically about COVID related illnesses, which would be, you know, very similar to like flu like symptoms, which doesn't really reveal anything disability related. Because what you have to be careful of is that you're not asking questions that are going to appear as though you're trying to find out about any long term or permanent disabilities that they have that could impact your decision about hiring them. So you can ask them, you know, have you been experiencing these symptoms like, like fever, chills, coughing, sneezing? You can ask them things like that. Um, you can take their temperature. Now, initially this said after you've made a conditional job offer, you can do any type of medical exam after making a job offer. But what started to happen now is a lot of companies are taking temperatures of everybody who comes into their facility. Would that be not just employees? Exactly. Wow. So if you have, you know, if you have a, a process set up where you have visitors to your facility and you're taking temperatures of people before you let them in, you can do that. You can take temperatures as long as you're consistent and you do it with everyone. And you're not just taking temperatures of people who might be over 65 years old or taking temperatures of males or females. So you can take temperatures of everybody coming in your door, whether they're employees or customers or visitors, as long as you're doing it consistently. And then as far as um, offering jobs, if for instance, you've made a job offer to somebody and then you have, you know, they maybe have some COVID symptoms and they relay that to you. Can you withdraw the job offer or can you delay their start date? You absolutely can. As long as it is specifically related to their symptoms that they've identified or having a temperature or being treated or being tested positive for COVID. So what you don't want to do is withdraw a job offer because again, you view someone as potentially being higher risk. So for instance, you know, some people believe that those of Asian descent may be more prone to COVID. Some you know, believe that those that are African American may be prone to COVID. So you can't withdraw an offer or make a decision based on factors that could lead to potentially discriminatory claims like that. So again, you just have to make sure you're very consistent in what you're asking, how you're uh, making offers, you know, if, if you do make an offer to somebody and then they come back and say, um, okay, I really want to come to work for you, but I, I don't want to come to your work site. I've been quarantined. I've been very careful. You know, can you withdraw the offer or can you delay a start date? Certainly you can. And, uh, but again, you should not base it on anything that could relate to any ADA type disability. So obviously you can't ask people, um, do you have diabetes? that obviously prones people to COVID more so. You can't ask them, do you have any type of um, you know, immune suppressant symptoms or conditions? Uh, have, you, you know, have you been treated with chemo recently? Or you can't ask anything like that that would be related to another condition outside of COVID. Hmm. You know, we've been using these abbreviations, ADA. Remind the people on this call who may not know, what does ADA stand for? Sure. Good question, Mike. Ad Americans with Disabilities Act. So any company with over 15 employees is um, obligated to comply with the ADA rules, which most people should know what they are, but you just, you can't discriminate against someone for a disability that they have, whether it's in making a job offer a promotion, any type of employment related decisions cannot be based on anyone's medical condition that could be qualified as a disability. You know, we've chosen thus far to kind of stay apolitical in these discussions. But what I'm seeing now is that there is growing sense that if the COVID kind of peaks and it starts to kind of slow down, that it will likely result in a resurgence later. 
And what I'm hearing is that resurgence could be about the same time that the flu kind of hits us as employers. So would you say that the discussion we're having right now will be as relevant in six months or a year as it is right now? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. And there's so there's so many questions. And this is a whole nother topic that we can uh, have a separate conversation and webinar on. But what's going to happen when when businesses start reopening? There's going to be so many variations of it, depending on your business, depending on the nature of what you do, where you're at, what state you're in, what the you know COVID situation is. But like Christina said, I think we're going to be dealing with this well into 2021. I don't think you know, that in 30 days, everything's done and over and we're back to normal. And, and there's a lot of discussion around what is the new normal. So I think a lot of companies and individuals are going to be even more cautious um, as a result of what we've been through. And, and probably will just change the way you do things in many ways, whether it's individually or as an employer. I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of changes just in the way people uh, live their lives on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, fear is going to be there. I think communication, like as I'm listening to you go through this slide, I'm just imagining if I show up to a job like I normally would, and the first thing I'm greeted with is a thermometer. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I think communicating that stuff up front. Yeah, I mean, can absolutely. you imagine if I go in for a job interview and I'm like asked all these questions about <laughs> fever and sickness and family sickness, and I'm not sure what's appropriate, what isn't appropriate, and yeah, I'm getting my temperature it. taken. At the door with a thermometer, a mask, and gloves. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm turning on my camera and I'm going into social media as I go back to my car. Like, you will never believe what I just went through applying for a job <laughs> at the ABC. Yeah. Like, it's, but again, I think that's going to become more prevalent, more normal, and not so much of a surprise to people going yeah, forward. The companies doing it to start with, though, I mean, they are going to be catching oh, yeah. people off guard, you know, and yeah. I mean, there's going to be this huge job market that opens up as things start to open up. Everybody who's unemployed, employers aren't going to take everybody they had yeah. back. They're going to pick and choose. Mm. Well, and I think there's, you know, there's two elements really to interviewing uh, right now. A lot of people, and I, I heard a story the other day about someone who was offered a pretty high level management job, never went into the facility, never met anybody they were interviewing. They did it all just like we're doing this. Yeah, so we're, we're here a more too. That's one of the things yeah. that Mark even said on that webinar. He said remote interviews are gonna become you know, incredibly important. Yeah. Letting people know what to expect when they get on that webinar, what your, mm -hmm. you know, what your guidelines are as far as don't have your kids in the background, don't have your dogs in the background. I wanna mm -hmm. you know, talk to you how long it's gonna be so you can have mm -hmm. appropriate child care. Things like that, um, companies, he said that he doesn't even answer, he doesn't even do meetings, like phone calls and in-person meetings. He only does meetings if there's going to be money at the other side of it. You know, he said mm -hmm. working from home, you get as much done in three hours from home as you do as eight hours in the office. If you think so many companies are going to realize that, so many workers are going to realize that. You know, the first day they go back into the office and they get brought into the conference room and they're in a conference room with 10, 15 people around a table and somebody sneezes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they're going to freak out. And that's the environment that employers are going to be dealing with. And I mean, somebody's going to make a video on their way home that day, like, oh my gosh, you'll never believe what happened to me. I was in a meeting today. We were in this tiny little conference room. Somebody sneezed. I'm probably going to die. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, Christine, I think, you know, you make a good point too about applicants and people that you may be bringing in for interviews or even if you've hired them and they're coming into work, you know, be very open about the situation with your company as it relates to COVID and what's going on. So they do know what to expect. And if they're going to come in for an interview, you know, let them know how that's going to work, where they're going to be sitting, you know, that you are going to practice social distancing. If you're wearing masks, make sure they know that if you're going to take their temperature. So be very open with people because they're going to want to know what's going on with this company that I might be coming to work for. So just like with your employees, the more information, the better. Share with them what's going on in your company and what you expect to happen so they have a, a clear picture of what they're coming into as well. Well, both of you all have stressed the importance of communication on an ongoing basis, but you just listed four or five things that we're going to have to be doing. We're going to have to be communicating even more um, going forward. Um, Christina, you made a comment about what could very well be emerging fears that people have. If you look at kind of where our mindset was for our first webinar, which was just five weeks ago, we were scrambling to try to figure out what are the health implications 
that we're having to deal with. And we're scrambling to how do we manage people who are working remotely from home. Now we're beginning to see is that for some, they've adapted very well and they're beginning to say, you know what, I kind of like this. And the idea of going back to the way it was is going to be difficult. For some, it's going to be a real challenge because it's going to feel kind of threatening to them. Um, it's for that reason we've invited next week uh, Emily Elrod to join us as a panelist. Uh, Emily is going to be speaking along the lines of how do you assure psychological safety for your employees? And uh, it's not talking about ADA and talk about HIPAA. We're talking about just very, very basic needs. So we're hearing that. And so that's a little bit of a uh, advertisement for next week's uh, webinar. Um, one of the things we did say we would also do is just give folks kind of a, an update on what's going on in uh, from a legislative uh, standpoint. Um, I'm I'm ever mindful that the, it's changing daily. It's changing almost by the hour. And um, what, uh, what we have seen in the news is the Senate has passed yet another stimulus bill. The House is scheduled to vote on that stimulus bill um, today. And if that's the case, just to kind of give you a quick um, sense of what that entails, I did this as recently as this morning, looking at several different sources, but uh, the total bill that, that's been added or will be signed into law, it's about 484 additional billion dollars. Um, um, of that, 210 billion is specifically earmarked for the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, and another 10 billion is gonna go into the Emergency Economic Disaster Loan Provision. Uh, on previous webinars, as a matter of fact, just last week, uh, we had Matt Pierce with the Small Business Administration. He's actually with the Small Business Development Center that works closely with the SBA, kind of walk us through that. But the reason why they're putting $210 billion back into the fund is because it got exhausted. Um, all the monies that were earmarked were basically uh, lent by last Thursday. They ran out of money. And what they have done in this um, specific legislation is they were hearing complaints that the big banks, and I'm sorry, we got bankers on this call here. We have large banks and we have small banks represented, but the complaint was is the big banks were given favorable treatment to clients that would generate more revenue for them. So 60 of the $210 billion, um, 60 billion that is, has been set aside for smaller lenders. Um, an additional, $75 billion has been earmarked to go straight to hospitals. Um, a number of hospitals are nonprofit, but the way they generate revenue is to have uh, elective surgeries. Well, elective surgeries have pretty much just disappeared. And as, as a part of the major part of the economic engine, $75 billion has been earmarked for hospitals. Uh, 25 additional billion dollars have been set aside for test and another 11 billion has been set aside for state government. And the balance is gonna to go to the CDC, the National Institutes of Health and related uh, government agencies. But there's 484 billion more that's gonna be hitting um, hopefully soon. And we don't have time this morning to go into detail, but what we have been encouraging the folks who've been tuning into this webinar is if you are a small employer defined as anybody who employs less than 500 employees, you at least meet the minimum criteria to apply for one of these loans. And if you have not, we're encouraging you to do so. Um, there's a backlog and it could very well be that you will not get approved, but if you don't get in line, it won't, it won't actually come. So we started these webinars saying, did you know there's something called the Paycheck Protection Program? Now, everybody knows about it, but we're trying to, to give them realistic expectations, but it's available to us. Um, so we're encouraging people to take advantage of that. Hope that makes sense. Mike, we've uh, got a question kind of related to that, but I think more so the previous, you know, funding of the Pay Paycheck Protection Act. I thought I'd heard that forgivable loans were for businesses with no more than 500 employees. Now we're hearing that large businesses receive loans. What is the criteria? So that relates to obviously the money that's gone. And a lot of the reason it is gone is somehow some of those larger businesses 
did find loopholes, and I know some of them are paying it back, but can you comment a little bit about what is the criteria now for uh, this new uh, set of funds being available to small businesses? Is it still for companies under 500 employees? Is that what the criteria is intended to be? It is. Here's what's interesting about this. The Small Business Administration uh, is for, quote, small business, but they define a small business as any employer that has 500 employees or less. Mm -hmm. Well, in my world, that's a big business. But the original stimulus was designed for, quote, small businesses. But there's a range of small businesses. Um, the vast majority of the small businesses employ one to 10 employees. Mm -hmm. The complaint was that these loans were going to, quote, small businesses that had 400, 450 employees squeezing out the very small businesses. So one of the reasons why they were trying to redirect some of these funds to be uh, lent by the small lenders is the small lenders tend to have clients that fit more of that definition. So to the question, um, I'm not aware that loans have been extended to businesses um, greater than 500, but it's been, go ahead. There were some loophole situations that weren't actually loopholes. Like uh, one of the biggest ones was like, what was it, Steak Shack or something? Restaurants that had locations that had less than 500. So the overall conglomerate has more than 500, but locations had an average of 45 employees. So they've received funds. As of this morning, they're planning on returning the funds because they were able to secure funding for someone else. In that specific case, um, a lot of the bankers have also been kind of defending how they operate and explaining internal operations, which just goes right back to communication again. Mm -hmm. They have separate departments that work with larger companies. So like you just said, most of your small businesses are under 10 employees. So for example, they have employees that are dedicated to working with needs of employers that have like 100 plus employees and ones that specialize in working with you know, 30, 40, 10 employees. So what happened was there's vastly more tiny businesses and these three or four people in the bank that worked on only those loans now have hundreds of thousands of applications that they're trying to process. Meanwhile, this side of the staff that only works with the bigger side had you know, less than a hundred applications to deal with. So they obviously got through those faster. So this goes back to that communication internally. And I mean, even Mark Cuban was saying on that webinar, like to try and do this fairly, they would have to route everything through one centralized company and it would slow it all down. So we're just kind of dealing with the best that we have. Um, bankers, again, communication, you said he had several on the call. Our banker has been absolutely fantastic. You know, we didn't get in on the first round. He has been communicating with us this whole time through text, through email, he's letting us know proactively. So we're not panicking and going, you know, are we going to get it? Are we not going to get it? Or, you know, things like that. He's sending emails out to everybody and letting them know ahead of time. That also reduces his headaches answering calls. So communication again. And I hate to be yet another bearer of bad news, but what has happened is now lawsuits are being issued against these banks for their practices. Um, the Small Business Administration is mandated, it's first come, first serve. So whenever you get in line, they're the ones who are managing the EIDL loans. The Paycheck Protection Loans are managed on behalf of the SBA through banks and credit unions, but they didn't specify exactly what criterion they would use, that is, who would get a loan when. Um, so you're exactly right, but here's interesting. You made a comment that a restaurant chain qualified and they're giving the money back. Mm -hmm. I wonder if part of that motive for giving it back is they got such negative publicity for yep. taking that money that back to the point while we started this whole webinar and that is their reputation was taken most likely a hit and they said, you know what, let's just give the money back. Let's find money elsewhere and save our reputation. Yeah, well, I mean, there's been several of the big like education institutions that are hitting that same thing. I think like Stanford's given the money back, uh, Harvard. Harvard has. They were not, they are not gonna take additional funds, but they are not giving the money back. They are using it, I think it was Harvard, I'm pretty sure, because they were the one that was on fire for having a $40 billion endowment. But they said they're not giving the money back. They're using it for students that are being impacted by COVID. So they're not using it for teachers and operations. They're making plans to give it to students and disperse it that way. 
So, but again, that goes back communication, reputations, you know, I think, I know you've been talking to some lawyers about getting them on. I think lawyers are going to become like lawsuits are going to be incredibly important, even for small business owners. It's going to be crazy. Like if you own like a restaurant or a clothing store and somebody comes in and they think they caught it, they heard you sneeze or somebody sneeze and they think they caught it. And then they passed it to a family member who died. I mean, you're talking about, you know, people's livelihood. You're talking people's lives. The lawsuits, even tiny businesses are opened up to. And everything will be in the media. So again, as a company, media can be your friend or your enemy. Yeah. Depending on what actions you're taking and what you're communicating. So, you know, yeah. make, make your message media your matter. friend <laughs> as much as you can. It's going to be yeah. interesting to see what Emily says. I know you said she's dealing with like yeah. the psychology of it all, but your messaging, even communicating with people like what these interviews are going to be like if they come to interview with you, you can communicate that message from a place of fear or you communicate it as a place of we care about you. Like the exact same words are going to come across one of two right. different ways. You're either terrified you're going to let a sick person in or you care about your employees and you're doing everything you can to protect them. So even just how you word things, like take half a second and see how it's going to come across. I mean, even advertisements that companies are putting out are being blasted all over social media is being distasteful. Like, you know, there was somebody who said, you know, enjoy your staycation with, you know, this spa set that we're offering or whatever this is not a staycation this is a quarantine <laughs> that hits wrong you know and those things are getting shared out on an unprecedented level so everything from reviews to the messages you put out there to what your employees are saying about you i mean there are roundup posts from news outlets that are going out right now they're like look at what these 10 companies are doing that makes them look insensitive during the covid crisis and, that's getting hit all over the place. It's not just on your own social media. I mean, you could be featured in one of those terrible news articles about a company that did something bad. You know, we have on this webinar representation across literally two dozen industries, but what does kind of tie us all together is, is everybody on this webinar are leaders. And as leaders, people are looking to you to lead. Um, but you also have to know what resources do you have available to you as leader? And so we've kind of begun listing some of the things. Rhonda, I'd like if you could to kind of hit some of these things. Um, we've got a few minutes left here. So can sure. you walk us through those? Yeah, and this, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, but just to let small businesses know that besides, you know, the, the money that's coming through the CARES Act, the PPP, the loans, there's a number of different resources out there for small businesses if you start looking into them that can help you maybe in small ways but they can definitely help small businesses so you know the SBA the small business development center network if you you know just search SBA and just about every city or locale has a local small business center that you can go to and they have a number of resources to help small businesses um, search your local you know your county or city state government. They have relief funds to help businesses within their community. There's industry specific support programs. So just like we're hearing about some of the relief coming for the hospitals and restaurants and things like that. Rhonda, did we lose you? I think she froze up a little bit. All right, well, I'll pick up where she was, and I'm sure she'll be back here in just a moment. Um, we've been, sound like we've been bashing bankers, and we don't in any way want to be implying that at all. Um, a number of you have banker friends. I've spoken to them. They have been literally slammed. They have shut down everything to try to, to accommodate this myriad of requests, but they are in business. And as business, they want to keep you as a customer. And they recognize that you too, as a business owner, um, might need some type of um, accommodation there. So um, if you need help, go to your lender, explain what's going on. They want to keep you as a client. And as a result, they may be much more open to um, relief, be it short term, to maybe even defer payments or even extend credit lines. Yeah, I, mean, I was even saying reach out to landlords and stuff as well, you know, ask for discounts because many of them are about to lose their commercial tenants to businesses that go under. So they're going to be a lot more likely to reduce or defer your payments, even all the way out through like 12 months. You know, somebody on that call asked, should I ask them to, you know, drop my rent by 20% for the next three months? And he's like, no, you should ask for more, 40 to 50% for the next 12 months. 
And I mean, that's, you know, what's coming. You know, and bankers are business owners. They got through into this the same as the rest of us. I mean, I think that's something people are not quite realizing as well, that these people at the SBA and these people at banks, they're just like everybody else right now. They got tossed into a COVID world. And then the government said, hi, you've got to help literally everybody from one day to the next. And they're struggling to figure out operationally how they do that, same as the rest of us. Mike, I see one question that came in that I think actually we all could voice, and I would love to hear the answer. Should you expect your employees to do the same amount of work if they are working remotely? Mm, good question. Rhonda, do we have you back? I am back. I don't know what happened. Everything just shut down. <laughs> so it was kind of strange. Well, good. Did you catch the question that Christina just read off? The I, I, Just the tail end of it. Can you read it again, Christina? Uh, should I expect my employees to do the same amount of work if they are working remotely? Well, I would say it depends on the situation. You know, if, if you're paying employees to work full time and they're working at home for you know, obvious reasons that they can't be at work, I think it just depends on what's going on with your business, how much they can accomplish from home. There's certainly some things that people are not going to be able to do from home. Um, but, but definitely, I mean, you should be able to expect a full workday out of them if you're paying them for a full workday. And really working remote can be an accommodation for people in many ways that you're helping them out um, along with, you know, keeping them protected during this time. So I would say for the most part, yes, you should be able to unless there are restrictions in what they can or cannot do from home in their job. So can I piggyback on that? It's perfectly reasonable for an employer to expect certain um, outcomes from their employees. But in today's time, it may be that employers need to be a little bit more flexible on perhaps when those things are done. Meaning, if you have folks at home who are not only trying to work but care, say for young children, because schools are closed, it's very difficult for them to do that. So they may be at their computer working, but they're not fully focused. As employers, we're encouraging our clients show some flexibility, give uh, this situation an opportunity to, if they have things that need to be done, does it have to be done between eight and five? Could it be done after hours? And if the answer is it can, that degree of accommodation is the right type of thing that we're strongly encouraging our clients. It's the kind of things that keeps negative reviews of employers off the internet because you're showing compassion. You're demonstrating a kind of a form of grace. Um, most everybody has been impacted and I think they're gonna be more forgiving um, of that. But in terms of a business, you've got a business to run. It's reasonable to expect certain outcomes. But Christina made an interesting comment that is not lost on me. And that is, if you don't have the interruptions, if you have dedicated time in a home setting without interruptions, you can get so much more done than you could if you're at work with those interruptions. And so it's interesting. It may very well be that your output doesn't suffer, but it doesn't take as long. And that's going to be, a, that's a new thing that we're going to have to be dealing with as leaders um, because we've just, we're in the midst of what has been described as this is the world's largest experiment at teleworking. Yeah. The whole world is dealing with this simultaneously and it's going to change how we do what we do yeah. without a doubt. Rhonda, yeah. when you dropped off, we, we got through a number of this slide here, okay. but I, I hope we did not um, miss an opportunity. Um, we are strong advocates for chambers of commerce. Uh, the Chambers of Commerce in which we have representation have been wonderfully supportive. Uh, the local chamber, uh, from where I'm speaking, has been uh, strongly supporting and advertising even these webinars. Uh, we're members of more than one Chamber of Commerce and they've agreed to do the same. So as a employer, resources available to you. If you're not a member of the chamber, we're encouraging you to give consideration. They are incredibly uh, adept at resources. They can connect you in ways that's just really unbelievable. If you are a member, and many of you on this call probably are, um, tap into it. Um, they are there to support its members and they're a valuable resource. I do want to get to this next slide because you, you brought up and you listed some things. I think that the folks on this webinar would like to hear about some additional resources 
Rhonda, you want to sure. go through these? Yeah, and these were just a few specific ones that companies might be interested in checking into. And we'll send this out, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on all of them. Um, but PayPal is waiving fees if you use PayPal for your business to you know, pay customers or pay your vendors. Uh, they're waiving fees for businesses in many cases. Google, if you do Google Ads, uh, there's some small business grants where they're giving credits back for advertising that you may be doing through Google. Uh, there's, a, there's a small business recovery fund called Hello Alice that Verizon's offering, and it's a $10,000 grant, not a loan, but a grant for small businesses. Now, I did read where they had one application cycle. It's closed, but if you go online, you can ask to be notified when the next application cycle opens up. Um, Square is the software company that if you use Square, um, you know, again, for, for credit card payments and so forth, they're refunding all software subscription fees for businesses for the month of April. Um, there's a Honeycomb crowdfunded small business relief loan. There's a uh, Save Small Business Fund that's offering $5,000 grants. And that application process just opened up this past Monday. So you could go to that website, and that is for businesses that employ between three and 20 employees. And again, you know, WeFunder Loans is another loan for small businesses. And SHL is a company that offers a lot of virtual tools, and they have a lot of free trials available. So they have a tool specifically to do online interviews. They have a lot of uh, webinar and video subscription type tools that can be tried out by small businesses. So we'll send this out and uh, there's definitely a couple of websites that link to many of these. So it's worth checking into because outside of what the government is funding, there's a lot of things that your local business, your local government, um, local industries and chambers and so forth are offering as well as some of these companies that are opening it up for small businesses. So there's a lot of help out there if you go and start looking at some of these. Just a reminder everybody on the webinar, Everything that we have shared with you today will be included in the packet that kind of goes out. I don't know if I said this on the front end, I do not believe we did, but we're in times that are unprecedented. And as such, we got to figure out how to have each other's back. And so anybody who's registered for this webinar uh, will be entitled, if you so choose, to have one-on-one -on -one time with Rhonda or with me. Uh, we've committed to blocking up to two hours to kind of hear what your issues are. Um, a number of you have asked questions that we can answer on the webinar. A number of you on this webinar might have questions that might be a little too sensitive to ask in this type of setting, or maybe a little bit too detailed to ask. So what we are committing to webinar participants is if you would like to take us up on this, uh, let us know. We'll include a, a link so that you know how to do that. But let me just say yet again, we're doing this because we want to be a resource for you. We want to be helpful to you. Um, we are probably like you, we're spending hours every day trying to take all this information that's coming at us and trying to kind of sift it down into what we hope would be a meaningful um, webinar topic or topics. We're about out of time, so I wanted to, if I could, just use this opportunity. Yes, Christina, you're you in the back with your hand raised. You are way too modest. Okay, so I want to say right now, Mike and Rhonda are absolutely amazing. Um, some of you, like some of these questions, like working remotely and how much you can expect people to, you know, give, that comes down to leadership. We made that move, you know, nine months ago, and our employees are more productive now than they were in the office. It comes down to understanding what your processes were like then, what they are now, what you need to step up and do as a leader. Mike and Rhonda are amazing at that. Mike understands what it takes to train your team. He understands what it takes as a business owner to build some kind of plan, even if it's just for the next two weeks or 30 days to have a plan that you need to execute that's gonna help you get that remote workforce going, that's gonna help you you know, get your ducks in a row so that you can be as productive as you can be right now. And Rhonda knows what it takes to get these HR things going. Like they are way too modest. If you are not taking people up on things like these two hour consultations, you are missing out. So like get on every webinar you can get on like this and take advantage of any expert that is willing to give you their time. 
if you are on this webinar, you obviously have questions, you need to book that two hour call. Christina, you're very kind. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to thank those who have taken an hour this morning to be with us. You have a lot of things you can be doing other than being on this webinar. We are very heartened that the vast majority of folks who have registered for today's webinar have been on the previous webinars. We're very flattered by that. We hope that that is a sign that you're finding value. Uh, what we're hearing from you is that this has been helpful and therefore we are committed uh, to continue to do this as long as this has been helpful. Therefore, if you don't have Thursday, next Thursday at 10 o'clock block, make a note of it. You'll get an invitation to next week's webinar uh, within the next day or so, but we hope that you would be willing to take us up on that. Uh, we are about out of time. So Rhonda, thank you. Excellent job. Thanks, Mike. And I'll just I'll add real quickly too. Uh, a number of you have emailed questions as things come up, and that's what we're here for. We're very open. If you want to call or email questions to us as you come across them, we really are trying to gear this towards smaller businesses where you know you don't have, you know you don't have a legal staff, you don't have an HR staff, you may not have a lot of resources to help you through these things. So that's what we want to be here for is to help you through these times that we've never dealt with before, but you know, we're working to try to find answers for all of you as you need it. So feel free to ask us any questions that come up and any topics that are of interest to you, make sure and email those to us so that we can include them in future webinars as well. Thank you again, Christina. You were as expected a great palace. Thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning. And for those who are on the webinar, thank you for giving us your time this morning and hope to see you back this time next week. God Thanks, bless everyone. everybody. Have a good day.